<laughs> good morning. Hey, I, I really had a, a good time putting this song service together. I hope you enjoy it. We're singing some songs that what I call old standards. We don't sing very much. Uh, Ryan is talking in, I don't know what terms you're going, where you're going with all of it. We want to talk briefly about the second coming. And so the songs that we're going to sing this morning deal with our hope, the things that we have to look forward to. I've also done something a little differently. I've shifted, I won't say the bulk of the songs here, but I've shifted a lot of what I want you to think about to our challenge songs. We're going to sing a medley, not just a song. Now, I've shortened some of the other stuff up front, so hopefully it will <coughs> time-wise work out about the same. But that is, is going to be, a, at least in my mind, a rousing finish. And I want you to come away from this morning being encouraged, having your hope reaffirmed, and uh, our brother John Smith used to say a lot of times we sing a better theology than we preach. And that's especially true when it comes to heaven. All right, for our call to worship this morning, I want to talk about glimpses of God, getting a glimpse of God. Because that's all we have right now. We, we were talking in classes where the parable of rich man and Lazarus, and, you know, and, and whatever else Jesus says in that parable, it just gives us this, this glimpse of what things might be like after we're dead. We don't know. We really don't know. And so it's a struggle. And so I turn to two Old Testament characters to see what they might have thought about it. The first is Job, Job 19. Now, the, the first 18 or so chapters of Job, Job's really down. I mean, a lot of bad things happen to Job. We all know that story. But partway through, it's like there's a shift in his mindset, and it occurs in these verses. And I've laid them out sort of in the poetic form like the, the text is laid out. As, as for me, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Now that's a big change. To affirm the fact. Now, Job may be the oldest written book in the Bible. It's already talking about a Redeemer. That's pretty amazing. I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. He's going to come back. Even in Job, we see the second coming. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Now God shows up later on in Job and makes a pretty dramatic presentation. But Job says, I know I'm going to see him when he comes back. Whom I myself shall behold, not somebody else. They won't have to tell me about it. I'll see it. And whom my eyes shall see and not another. And I love this last phrase. Look at his reaction. My heart faints within me. So Job had a glimpse of God, and he knew he'd see more later. The next one is David, 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is after the whole Bathsheba and the, her husband thing, and they've had the son, and as God said, the son dies, and while the son was, in, was really sick, David was laying prostrate on the floor, he was praying, he was going on and on, he, was, he wouldn't eat. <clears throat> to the point the servants were afraid to tell him the son was dead. But when they finally he dies and they're scattered, right? he says, what, the kid died? I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> and they said, yeah, we were afraid to tell you. He gets up, takes a bath, combs his hair, says, fix my dinner. He sits down and eats. They said, what's with this? You've been in sorrow while well, he's alive, now he's died. Everything's okay. Well, David says, and he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Here's the glimpse. I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So again, the resurrection, reuniting theology is expressed by David here. The glimpse of God. He knows it's going to be worked out in the end. And so as we sing these songs this morning, thinking about heaven and thinking about we too only have glimpses, let's make sure we know that our Redeemer lives and that He's coming back. The King is coming. <clears throat> Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now His face I see, oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. 
possible. So now as we prepare our minds to share the Lord's Supper together, this is one of my favorite songs to set up the Lord's Supper. It is finished. The reason I put all the slides, if you know it well, I'm not going to sing the chorus after every verse. This will walk you right through it. It is finished. There's a line that's been drawn through the ages. On that line stands the old rugged cross. On that cross, a battle is raging for the
Now, I don't believe they could count that well back then. <laughs> Some estimates say it could be as high as 850,000. Okay? That's a huge number. December 7th, 1941. It was 81 years ago. We all know that as Pearl Harbor Day. 2,390 people died there in Pearl Harbor, service members and civilians. Almost half, 17, more than 1,700 perished on the USS Arizona. The USS Arizona was a battleship one moment and a cemetery the next. And all those people are still there. Um, all those souls. That, by the way, is more than died in the Titanic. <coughs> World War II, the deadliest conflict in human history. 70 to 85 million people perished as a result of that war. And you say, well, they weren't all in the military, were they? No. Tens of millions of people died through genocide and cultural cleansing, or whatever you call it. Germany was not the only culprit, by the way. Many nations killed tens of millions of their own people during that conflict. Three percent of the world's population died during those years. And I like to figure it's it's somewhere between 70 and 85 million. There's a 15 million person gray area there. 15 million. That's as accurate as they can come up with. Not so long ago, 9-11 <clears throat> happened in the year 2001. <clears throat> 21 and a half years ago. Seems more recent than that. 21 and a half years ago, 2,983 people died. And they still read those names. <clears throat> Have you ever thought of how long they're going to do that? At what point does someone say, well, we don't need to do that anymore? Are they going to read 2,983 names, which takes <coughs> about three hours, forever? Or will they eventually just say, we, we're past it now? Um, two, three generations have passed, whatever, and we're not just going to read all those names anymore because it's going to become um, older in our history. Okay, none of these uh, lives or deaths impacted mankind as much as one life. And that's the Son of God, the Christ Jesus. Millions have died, but only one man impacted the planet the same way. And that was the Son of God. Approximately, and I say that approximately, the year 33. Uh, that was 1990 years ago, approximately. Uh, <coughs> Jesus died. But it would have been over at that point if nothing else happened. Uh, why do we continue to raise his name up on Sunday mornings? Why do we continue to remember him? Why do we celebrate that one person the same way that we celebrate many other tragedies that have happened, and, but we consider that a victory? And not only do we remember him, but we remember the fact that he arose and that's the important thing he arose from the dead and he won the war over sin and he won uh, the war over our sin and that's why people have memorials Christians have this memorial every Sunday, not just because we should or it is an example. It's because we never want to forget 
Jesus and what he's done. Every day of our life, we need to remember that we live for God. We live for the sacrifice given. And we are forgiven because of that sacrifice. So his death really, really mattered. So let's remember him in all that we do, especially now as we share in this, this bread and the fruit of the vine. bow with me as we offer prayer. We thank you, Father, for the blessings in life, your Son, who you gave. You loved us so much that you did that for us, and he has won the battle. And Father, we rejoice in that victory, because we could not win it. We may try to fight it, but we can't win that battle. Only Jesus can for us. So we remember him and that sacrifice that he uh, gave his own body that we did not need to, that he gave his own body as the perfect lamb of God, where we could never be perfect, only perfected in that sacrifice. <coughs> Father, we pray um, that as we partake of this bread, that we would truly remember him. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus bled and died, and that's what this represents. His blood, uh, that precious blood, the blood of life. Father, without blood we die, and without his blood he died. We remember that blood sacrifice. The only blood that can cleanse our sins. We pray now that we remember him and that sacrifice in Jesus' name. sacrifice our lives back to you and how we give ourselves 
back to you and shine our lights out to the community around us. We thank you for his great example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have a, a, a cartoon and it begins with a sort of sad looking snowman that has a sign that says repent sinners. Another one 
says the end is near and finally the third one says spring is coming <laughs> and he's melting away and then Calvin speaking to his mom says that there are snowman prophets of dew and his mother says you certainly take the pleasure out of waiting for the daffodils <laughs> so we're going to talk today about this idea of the end of time the end being near um, and and we want to talk about what that looks like and what we do to be ready for that to happen. Um, somebody said something, I think it was uh, Steve said something about the, the dramatic presentation. Um, it, it made reference to that in passing. And when we talk about the return of Christ, it's definitely spoken of in terms of a dramatic presentation, a dramatic event. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus says, in those days, after that tribulation, he's just gone through and talked about all of these, these bad things that are happening. He says, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. And so we, we, we have this contrast that Jesus sets up of, of very bad things happening and then a very good thing happening that the earth is going to be uh, in chaos. There's all of these, these, these you know, tribulations and <laughs> the sun is darkened and the moon is darkened and all this stuff. But then the Son of Man comes and Jesus returns and he releases his angels to go gather his elect up. So there's a positive and there's a negative to this. And, and when we talk about this end of time, this return of Christ, that is the dichotomy that is the essential underlying principle behind what we're looking at is this dichotomy between what is a positive experience for some and a negative experience for others. And, and throughout history, this, this whole concept of the return of Christ has captivated the attention of humanity. And many, many different people have tried to figure out when it's going to happen, what it's going to look like, all of those kinds of things. And today we want to start off by talking about a man with a plan, a man who thought he had the solution, the answer to those questions. It's this guy right here. His name is William Miller. <clears throat> William Miller was born in the latter half of the 1700s in uh, New York, in eastern New York. He moved around a little bit, but eventually, after fighting in the War of 1812, he moved back to New York. And it was shortly after he returned to New York that he concluded that, that first of all, he had some religious experiences during the war. Um, that had he brought, He'd been a Baptist, he'd fallen away. When he came back from the war, he'd had some experiences that brought him back to his Baptist faith and to the Lord, in, in a broad sense anyway. But he'd had some experiences that made him believe that he had been given insight into understanding the return of Christ. And in particular, he focused on a passage in, da in Daniel chapter 8, and one particular verse, and I'm going to read a little bit more of it here for us, but Daniel 8, 14 was what he was focused on. In Daniel 8, chapter 13, it says Daniel has, has observed these, a bunch of weird events taking place, and he's very confused, and it says, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one, these are angels he's referring to, said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? Now, like I said, I'm not going to give you enough context, but we don't have time to read all this. The, the short version is he's seen these visions about um, desolation and, and destruction of the Jewish state and the, the, the fixing of that ultimately to come. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. And when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of the man between the banks of the Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. This is a, one of the places that, that the, we, the phrase, the end times, is drawn from. And this idea of this 2300 evenings and days was one that affected Miller's thinking deeply. He believed that that was a, a key to understanding when Christ was going to return. And he used a fairly common theological tool or numerological tool that's used even by people who are trying to understand some of these things today, and that is the idea that one day equals one year. It's interesting that it's a very specific 2300 that seems like an awfully round number, but then God deals in round numbers a lot of times. So Miller concluded that 2300 days, one day, one year, and therefore if you could calculate when the starting point was of the 2300 days, you could figure out when Christ was going to return. 
And so he decided that the starting point would be 457 BC, which was when Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, who was at that time the one in charge of the Jews that had been taken into captivity by Babylon, but Persia succeeded them as the ruling empire. That was the date that Artaxerxes issued a decree that allowed the Jews to go back to, to rebuild Jerusalem, and they actually went back and began to rebuild the temple. And based on the things that Daniel says in his vision, I can see where Miller might have said that's, that makes the most sense as the place to start from. So Miller came up with a theory. He said, okay, so 457 BC is when it started. You add 2,300 years to that, and you get that equals 1843. I can't believe nobody's ever thought of this before. I always thought, I was wondering about that. You know, Miller, he, 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 he believed he had some, some sort of a divine insight, and, and he does just some very, very basic math and goes, well, I, I don't know why nobody's ever brought this up before. You know, I'm guessing that other people had, and maybe they thought, well, this seems ridiculous. It can't be that easy. I don't know what the, exactly the deal was, but ultimately Miller decides that it's going to be 1843 when Jesus is going to come back. Now, it's a little complicated because he knows that Daniel is probably working off a different calendar than he was, and he's not completely unaware of that because the Roman calendar that is in effect today and was in effect in Miller's time was developed long after the book of Daniel was written. So, so he goes and he looks at the rabbinical calendars, which the Jews would, have, would be were using during his time period anyway, and he concludes that because it's you know, a year, not, it's not one day, it's a year that Artaxerxes issued the command. We don't know exactly what day. Therefore, we can say, okay, so it's sometime within a specific year. And looking at where the rabbinical calendar works from, basically from March to March, he says it must be that it's going to happen sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. So this is, I'm not exactly sure which day it's going to be, but it's going to be somewhere along in there. Now, he started doing these calculations we started thinking this through not too long after the War of 1812, so in the, in the early, in the mid-1815, 1816 range. It's not until 1823 that he's sure he's right. I don't know why. It seems like that's pretty basic math, you know. But ultimately, it takes him, he does a lot of study. He actually went through it really, I mean, he put a lot of effort into studying the scriptures to try to make sure he understood this correctly. So he finally comes up with what he's pretty much completely certain that he's right in 1823. But he's, he's nervous about releasing this, probably for the reason I was saying, because you know, it, it seems such like such an obvious thing, he must be wondering why isn't anybody else picking up on this, you know? But because that date is coming up on him, 1843 is not that far away, finally in 1832 he goes public with this. He writes a series of 12 treatises that he, that he hands out on a kind of a limited scale to people, kind of saying, hey, get ready because it looks like maybe just 20 or 10 years from now, Jesus is going to come back. Now, under normal circumstances, say for example today, there would be an internet site devoted to Miller and that would be pretty much it. Even back in that time, there were lots of people coming up with all sorts of ideas and, and it probably would have just kind of gotten passed along under the currents of history, except for one other thing that was going on during this period of time. It was called the Second Great Awakening. There's two different major religious revivals in American history. One of them actually predates the, the period when we actually became a country. It was during the colonial time. The Second Great Awakening took place between 1790 and 1840. It's significant because not only did things like Miller's ideas come about, but a number of other things did, one of which was the foundation of the modern day churches of Christ. Um, the Barton Star, the, the Stone Campbell movement took place during this period of time. It's also the period of time in which the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints came about. And a lot of this is because there was a massive amount of mental energy being put into religion and religious questions, questions of Christianity by Americans in particular. Um, there was a, a religious revivals happened for a lot of different reasons. This one was a combination of different factors, but there's a lot of thinking and refocusing on religious matters, on matters of faith. And in the case of the, of Barton, the Barton Stone movement, the, or the Stone Campbell movement, I should say, I keep saying Barton Stone, that's the guy's name, the Stone Campbell movement, that was a refocusing on let's make sure we're actually doing what the scriptures want us to do. But in some other cases, it was kind of some, you know, where everybody's talking about religion, I think I've got an idea kind of a thing. Well, Miller's idea was kind of a halfway between the two. He's thinking about something in the scriptures, but he's taking it in a direction people haven't gone before. But because of the Great Awakening, because there was so much attention being paid to religious matters and so much interest in religious matters, Miller's ideas didn't just kind of get swept under the rug. Instead, they became publicized. And a guy named Joshua Vaughn Himes, who wrote a journal called Signs of the Times, began to publicize Miller's writings in 1840 to really get them out there because he began to believe in them and he wanted people to know about it because and you can understand why I mean if Jesus is coming back people want to get ready people want to know what's going to happen so so he begins to publicize it and the thing is it just takes off 
thousands and thousands of people begin to follow this movement, and people who are, have come over from the UK and places in Europe, especially from the UK though, they hear about this and they go back home and they end up starting up congregations that are based around Miller's teachings. And they're fundamentally, they're Baptists, but it's built around the idea of the second coming of Christ. And so there's all of this interest. There's thousands of people following this. And when it gets closer and closer to the time period, it's kind of problematic because, of course, March 21st, 1843, nothing happens. And as the year progresses, people become increasingly convinced it must be March 21st, 1844, because that's the most dramatic. You know, when we're thinking about a time frame, it's kind of, we tend to think of it's going to be that last day, you know. And as that day comes closer and closer, more and more people are gathering together in New York around where Miller is. More and more people are coming together in congregations that are ready for the return of Christ. And March 31st, 1844 came and went, and there was no trumpet. And so Miller is a little bit disheartened by this, but he decides, you know what, maybe I made a mathematical error. Maybe I should not have revived, relied on the rabbinic calendar. Maybe I should rely on an older Jewish calendar called the Karaite calendar. Maybe that's the one that actually is the one that I should have used. And that one has slightly different setting uh, of dates. It's, it's a little bit of a different thing. So he goes back and redoes the math using the Karaite calendar, and he comes up with April 18th of 1844. So that one becomes publicized. Most of the people that came for the March, the March one haven't left yet, so they, they're still hanging out and everything. And so everybody's gathered together, and they're waiting for April 18th. And notice now he's moved from a, a time period until to a definite time, because it can't be much past that. That's the end of the, of the 2,300 years. But April 18th, 1844, comes and goes, and there's no trouble. So the followers are, are deeply distressed by this. Miller himself is deeply distressed by this. If he heads back into his you know, study or whatever, and some of the other leaders of the Millerite movement, they start doing some more work on it. And eventually, uh, Miller, working with some others, comes up with a new idea. And so in August of 1844, so several months after the, this second lack of uh, trumpet, a guy named Samuel Snow, who's been working with Miller, comes out and says, okay, we actually now, we know for sure, and he uses the, the phrase, the true midnight cry, the actual arrival of Jesus, we know for sure that it's going to happen on the 10th day of the 7th month of this present year, 1844. We figured this out. I, I don't know exactly what they did to come up with that number, but they were definitely sure that it was going to happen. Well, the 10th day of the 7th month, he was referring to the rabbinic, or to the Jewish calendar, so the actual date is October 22nd, 1844. We know it's going to happen. So August, we've got we've got you know two or three months, and then it's going to happen. And, and so the, the 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 thing that's astonishing to me is personally, after the first one passed, I would be like, you know what, I'm out, I'm done. But but most of the people stayed around because they, they bought. They, it wasn't just they bought into this; they wanted this to be. And you can't blame them. They wanted Jesus to come back. We want Jesus to come back. We're not trying to necessarily pick the date. But we wanted to. We wanted to come back. They wanted this to happen. They wanted. To, they wanted to believe that this was true because. You know, the idea of, of, of the return of, of the master, this is a big thing. And so people don't just want to walk away from this. They want this to work. They want to buy into the principles that underlie this. And so they, they gather together, and again, it's even more people on October 22nd, 1844, that have come to New York, to eastern New York, where Miller is, to where the Millerites are gathering, that are gathering in churches throughout the U.S. and the U.K., and they're waiting for this to happen, and the whole day goes through, and there's no trouble. Again. And one of the guys, there's a writing, it's one of the saddest things you'll ever read, this guy who talks about, you know, like basically staying up all night and, and nothing happens. And he goes to bed and he's just like the most depressing, he's just depressed. He goes to bed and he's like, I can't believe it didn't happen. You know, I don't know what to say. My, my world is basically falling apart now because he didn't come back. And this day is known as the great disappointment when it comes to Millerism. And Millerism will disappear immediately or shortly thereafter. It will be replaced by a number of different try ways, attempts to analyze what went wrong and what they misunderstood and different things like that. And we're not going to go into all of those, but I will tell you that one of the most significant organizations to come out of this is actually the Seventh-day Adventists. Because they took Miller's theology and ran with it in a slightly different direction and came up with, with the theology that, that lasts because it doesn't revolve around predicting the physical appearing of Jesus Christ. Because you see, the real problem is that Miller, for all that he had studied, and he had studied a lot, the time that he spent researching and, and reading the Bible, he forgot to read the second part of the sentence, or the, of, the, of the paragraph about the actual return and the trumpet and everything. In Mark chapter 13, the passage he's already read, it finishes with this. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. 
I don't understand how you can read this passage and think, I can predict the time that it's going to happen. Because, because if, if, if he could, first of all, I don't mean that Daniel had known the time, but now he can know the time. And the whole point is that only the Father knows the time. You can't predict when Jesus is going to come back. And this is an important message for us, an important fundamental lesson when it comes to thinking about the return of Christ, thinking about that day, and that is that it is about preparation, not planning, not prediction. I use the word planning because of the, the, the problem with planning is it suggests the idea of having a plan, and planning and preparation can kind of go hand in hand, but, but preparation versus planning, preparation versus prediction, it's not about trying to figure out when it's going to happen, it's about what you do to get ready for when it's going to happen. Jesus says in the passage we just looked at, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when it's going to happen. There is a way to prepare for something that you don't know when it's going to happen. In fact, that's pretty common in our society. We have people who are called preppers, who are prepared for doomsday, and it's various kinds of doomsdays. It's a chemical attack, a biological attack, it's a crash in the economy, it's nuclear war, it's zombies in some people's cases. And you'd like to think that was like a joke, but it's really not. Um, the fact is that, that, that there are a lot of people in our society that are prepping for bad things to happen. They have fallout shelters filled with food and guns and things like that. They, they, they're, they're prepared for an eventuality that may never happen, but they think it might, and so they're getting ready for it. And so preparation is something you can do even when you don't know even exactly what the threat is, and certainly what you can do even when you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Over in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. That phrase, by the way, comes up, comes up way more in the New Testament than I ever realized it did until I started reading this, or studying for this, this uh, message. Be on the alert. Be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this. If the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Now notice there, he's talking about that being on the alert. He uses that same phrase twice. If he'd known when he was coming, he would have been on the alert. Be on the alert. What he's saying is if he'd known when he was coming, he would have been ready for him to come. He would have been prepared to deal with that situation. So being on the alert is not knowing when the thief is coming, even though Jesus uses that phrase, it is being ready for him to arrive and being able to do something about it. Jesus goes on and says, For this reason you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave who the Master has put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Now it feels like we've sort of transitioned, like we've gone from Jesus is talking about the concrete of I'm coming back to some sort of a parable about masters and servants. But the reality is that he's leaning one idea directly into the other. Because he's saying, you're going to get ready, you've got to be ready for him to come, because he's going to come when you don't expect him, when you don't think it's going to happen, when you're not planning for it in your mind to happen that moment, that's when he's going to come back. And then he says, so, so the example I want you to understand is somebody who's been given authority, somebody who's been given a task to do, to take care of the servants, his fellow servants, his master said, you take care of giving them their food, you run the household. And Jesus says, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Blessed is that slave who's actually doing what he's supposed to do. He's giving their food, he's running the household, he's, he's done what he's supposed to with the authority that he was given. Truly I say to you that he, the master, will put him, the servant, in charge of all of his possessions because he knows he can be trusted now. He can be given all the authority and when the master goes away the next time he knows that guy's going to take care of it. But, but if, that's not how it goes, but if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When he says, when he says an hour he doesn't expect him or does not know, the simple fact is when you think about the way that that guy's living, there's no hour that he's expected. There's no hour that he's prepared for. And a lot of times we deal with people who think, and not just in terms of the, the, the biblical truth of Jesus' return, but more broadly, we deal with people who think in terms of, I can wait until the last minute and still get it done. I deal with this a lot teaching high school. It might surprise you learn that. But, but astonishingly, a lot of my students think that they can wait until the last minute and they get things done. And so it turns out they can't. They, they think they can, but they don't really know what they can do and what they can do. By our age, most of us have learned what you actually can get done during a certain amount of time, most of the time. 
But 15 and 16 and 17 year olds have a, they radically <laughs> overestimate what they can finish in a day, you know, and how easy it's going to be and whatever else. And so they, a lot of times they, and what's funny then is of course then after they don't turn the assignment in, the conversations I have with them. So they'll come to me, I had one girl who basically done nothing for the entire semester. Um, she failed to turn in one thing after another and, and she was at a point where the last set of assignments that she could still turn in had been due, and they had they were they were coming due that night, the night that she came to talk to me at midnight. They were due. And she came to talk to me, and she said, "Can you give me an extension on these assignments?" I said, "Why?" She said, "Well, I have to work tonight." And I said, well, "Did you know you had to work tonight before tonight?" And she said, "Yeah." And I said, did you know the assignments were due before tonight? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, then I don't understand why this event now is the reason why you're not doing your assignments. This event now is why you're not doing your assignments tonight. But it's not the reason why you didn't do them before. In the weeks that they've been due, and, and so ultimately I told her, no, because everybody else is under the same rules. Why should she get a special exemption? The fact is that most of us, when we put things off, at the point that they come due, we either figure out some frantic way to get them done, or we don't do them and we come up with an excuse that has very little to do with the reasons why we're not ready. And that's what Jesus is really saying here is that, that you know what you're supposed to do. The master has given his slave instructions on what he's supposed to do, so there's not really any excuse when the master comes back if he hasn't been doing it. And he takes it a step further. It's not just this guy forgot to feed somebody one day or something like that. It's actually that he's taking advantage of the authority that he's been given. He's beating his fellow slaves, he's eating and drinking. The idea is that he's eating and drinking the food that's supposed to be given to the slaves. Basically, he's abusing the authority. He's not just not doing what he's supposed to. He's actively failing to do or doing things he's not supposed to do. And, and this obvious failure to prepare for the master's return, it's an obvious mindset of, I don't even care when the master comes back. Because if I really cared, I wouldn't do it like this. I wouldn't be behaving like this. Over in Luke chapter 12, a parallel kind of a passage to this, um, G Jesus is talking and he adds an important phrase, I think. And he says, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. The one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Now that is an interesting theological discussion all of its own. We're not going to do that today because <laughs> this is one sermon, that's a different sermon. But the next thing that Jesus said, this goes back to the first part of the one who doesn't get ready. Jesus says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. We've been entrusted with much. You may not think it, but you have. Because you've been entrusted with the gospel. The gospel is infinitely valuable, Jesus has told us before. What is it we've been entrusted with? Well, Jesus gives us a whole bunch of different commands and ideas, but ultimately, I think you can boil it down to basically three ideas. The first is to love. The second is to seek righteousness, and the third is to share the gospel. Those are the three things that ultimately we've been given more than anything else, and you can break those down into smaller categories and everything else, but at the end of the day, those are the three things that we've been left to do, that we've been given by our master to take care of. And the question is, having been entrusted with so much, having been entrusted with the grace in Jesus, are we doing those things? Are we ready for when the master returns? Because the one thing that we know from the scriptures about the about Jesus' return, well, there's several things, but one of the things we know about Jesus' return is that there are going to be some very mixed reactions when he comes back. Different people are going to have different experiences. I'm reminded, I could not find a perfect picture of this. This is the best one I could come up with. The distinction between the end of a, of a basketball game. There are some people that are really happy and there are some people that are really sad. And, and especially, it's especially true if you watch a game where it's very close and there's some final massive deciding play that decides it or there's a sudden shift at the very end of the game and the team that thought they were going to win ends up losing but there's there's always this distress and you can see it here there's the, the player who's joyful because he's just won and there's the player who can't believe that he's lost and in this case part of the factor too is that this particular championship the team that should have won lost and, and it was kind of embarrassing that they lost but there's this differential reaction some people are happy, some people are sad. It's the same outcome, it's the same game. Everybody had the same experience, but one person experienced it from the standpoint of losing, and one person experienced it from the standpoint of winning. Jesus says, that's, that's how this is going to be when I come back. In Matthew chapter 25, he uses another parable to give an example of what this is going to be like. He says, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were foolish and five were prudent, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. So just in case you're not familiar with the kind of lamps we're talking about here, these are lamps that are probably kind of like a, like a, a vessel of some sort that has a wick coming out of it. You would add oil to it and the, the wick would burn off that oil as you go along. And so there's a limited resource of oil and if you don't keep it trimmed or have it added to it and then also keep moving the, uh, the wick itself, either the wick will go out because it'll get into the oil and we, it, it won't burn once it's actually submerged in the oil. So you have to keep the wick out far enough but you also have to keep enough oil in there. So he said the prudent took oil flasks along with their lamps. He says, now when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. I want us to notice a really important principle here, a really important idea here. In general, when the scriptures talk about being asleep, it's a negative thing. It's you're, you're asleep when you should be awake. Here, the sleep is not a negative. Because both sets of virgins fall asleep. Here, the sleep is a reference to our physical life. The world that we exist in now, where we're making choices and doing things, the virgins fall asleep, and the question is, did you get ready for when the bridegroom was going to come? Because the bridegroom comes, and they get up, and they trim their lamps. That, like I said, that means you've got to get your wick ready, you've got to make sure you've got enough oil. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us, and you too go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. So the prudent were ready. They added the oil to their lamps. They had what they needed. They were good to go. The unwise, the foolish, they weren't ready. They didn't have enough oil and they could not survive or they were, their lamps were not going to be lit by the time the bridegroom got there. Jesus says, and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later the other versions also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then for you do not know the day nor hour. Now, does he really not know them? Probably not. Presumably he knew them because they were invited to do the thing at the wedding. What he's really saying is, you're pretty useless. Your job was to have lamps, to, 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 not, to, to be able to guide the procession or to be part of the, 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 the ceremony of the procession. Showing up now with your lamp is meaningless. It's like you know, showing up after a car wreck with the brakes that the car needed to make the stop before it you know, got into the wreck. It's too late, and the phrase we use, you know, you're closing the barn door after the horse is already gone. That's basically what's happening. It's too late. You can't, you can't show up after the, the door has been closed and expect to get into the party. And, and when Jesus talks about the trumpet, when that trumpet sounds, time is up. There's no, there's no time at that point to go fix things. You don't get like, you know, can you give me like 30 days, Jesus? Just, I mean, maybe, maybe even just five days. That would be enough. I can go fix some things and I'll be ready. There's nothing like that. There's no more choices at that point. There's no time left. It's all over. That's what happens when Jesus returns. So being alert, in this case, doesn't mean staying awake. Not in the context of this parable. Being alert means being ready for what's going to happen when the bridegroom <coughs> actually comes back. And I think it's interesting because he chooses the, the metaphor of lamps, something that gives light. And that's the gospel. Jesus talks about us being, being lights to the world and not putting our lights under a bushel, not hiding our light. And I think when we talk about what Christians are called to do more than any other single thing, it is to spread the gospel. We love, we try to seek righteousness, but ultimately the gospel is the core thing that's been entrusted to us, the core thing that we're asked to do. And so if we have the gospel and we're not sharing it, we're not spreading it, we're letting the master down. We're not feeding the servants the way we're supposed to. We're not giving them the food of truth. But, but Jesus also, I remember, he, he uses that idea that, they, that these, the servant in one of his parables was abusing his fellow servants. And I wonder sometimes when we have the gospel, if, if we don't sometimes just think, well, I'm good to go. You know, it's taken care of. My problem is solved. And we have a mindset of a lack of compassion for those who are outside of the gospel, not really recognizing just how necessary and important it is that they hear the word. And sometimes I think that might be abusive. Getting, getting something really wonderful that you know everybody needs and then just basically hoarding it for yourself and going into a, a building and talking about it with other people who have also got that thing and never really telling anybody else about it, that's abusive. 
That's not, that's worse than just not giving people the message. It's being content with what you've been given and not sharing it. And then the faithful servant doesn't do that. The faithful servant uses what's been given, that's been entrusted to him or her, and, and, and does what the master wants him or her to do with it, which in the case of the gospel is to share it, is to spread it. And we have this idea then, and this goes back to the very beginning that we started from this idea that there's a time coming, there's a day coming when the faithful servant and the disobedient, all, to, all of them are going to experience the same, the same event. But the perspective on that event is going to be radically different. In Luke chapter 21, again, this is a parallel to some of the passages we've been looking at. Jesus says, There will be signs on the sun, the moon, and the stars. On earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Obviously, this is a dramatic presentation. This is a dramatic kind of event. Um, this is a scary kind of a thing. People are experiencing terror and experiencing upheaval in a way that they've never really experienced before. And he goes on and he says the same thing as before. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and glory. But the one thing that Luke adds in that I think is really important is that Jesus is speaking to his people, his listeners, and he says, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See, the, 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 the people who are not Obedient, the disobedient, when Jesus comes back, are going to be in terror. They're going to be afraid of what's happening. Those who are in the Lord, those who have the confidence of their faith, are not going to be that way. Now, that doesn't mean that those bad things aren't going to affect them, too. An earthquake hits everybody, no matter how serene you might be about it. But the fact is, the reaction to that is the recognition that this is the end. This is the return of the Master. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. But it's all about what we've, the choices that we've made leading up to that point. It's not going to be in that moment you're suddenly going to make the choice to do the right thing and everything's going to be okay. It's going to be what you did that got you there and got you to that point. And it doesn't matter when it happens, and it doesn't matter exactly what it looks like. I've talked about the idea that, visually speaking, there's no physical way for everybody to see Jesus come back at the same time because we're all facing in different directions around the globe. <coughs> but whatever's going to happen, however this is going to look, whatever you know, change in reality or whatever, how you want to think about it, Jerry thinks the planet's going to blow up. That would definitely get my attention. Um, however it is, everybody's going, to, everybody's going to experience it. And the only difference is going to be whether you're ready for it. Not that you knew it was going to happen or when it was going to happen. Not that you had a specific plan for exactly how it was going to go. But are you ready for this to happen? Are you ready for God to come back and for there to be an end? Because Paul says, if you are one of the ones who's ready, if you are one of the righteous, one of the, the, the chosen, one of the, the faithful servants, then you have something to look forward to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is taken from the New Life Translation. I like the, the, the phrasing, a wonderful secret. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. He says, we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. From the, when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. I like that phrase. The, the other, phrase, the other uh, versions of this translation talk about the twinkling of an eye, but the blink of an eye is something that has a, we, we know what that looks like. A blink of an eye is just an instantaneous thing. So fast that most of you don't realize you've blinked in just the amount of time since I started this sentence and finished it. I'm watching you, actually. Because we do it so often, we don't even think about it because it happens so quickly. But he says that, that there's going to be a moment in which you are, we are taken from the mortal, from the physical, from the way that this life has been for all of our existence, and in a blink of an eye, in an instant, everything's going to be changed. The world is going to be transformed. We are going to be transformed from, from, from dying husks into a permanent, living, eternal body. And it's all going to happen in an instant. He says, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. <clears throat> There's going to be a moment when we all look up and we see the Son of Man coming in glory. We hear that trumpet 
And in that instant, we are going to be transformed. In the blink of an eye, we are going to be transformed. And we're in that moment, we're going to know, did we make the right choices? Did we do the right things? Did we not do the right things? Did we do what God wanted? Are we part of that, his, his family, or are we not? And we're going to see that when he comes. And in that moment, we're going to experience that change. And if we are his people, if we have done what he asked us to do, if we are faithful servants, then we will be transformed into eternity. And we will be with the Lord forever. And that's the subject of our next lesson. But for today, what I want us to remember, I want us to think about is that instant is the culmination of everything that we're waiting for. That instant is, is, the, is the, the fulfillment of the faith that we've had. Paul talks about, you know, that we, we walk by faith and not by sight. That's the moment when faith and sight become in, indistinguishable. They're the same thing. And in that moment, the question really that comes down to it, and the question I have for you today is this. When that moment happens, are you going to be one of the people that's screaming and running around and asking for the mountains to cover you over? Or are you going to be one of the ones who stands up and lifts up your head and says, I Let's dance. Somewhere morning when the sun is over. Right. 